Now that we're out of the pandemic, let's talk about other times an illness has knocked the United States on its backside. And yes, COVID is still with us, but it's no longer at the level to be considered a pandemic or an epidemic. Here's the definition of epidemic. An epidemic is defined as a widespread occurrence of an infectious disease in a community at a particular time. Pandemic is the same thing, but it has to include an entire country or the world. It's how COVID became a pandemic. The United States, like most countries, have had an epidemic in their history. Some have been barely noticeable, while others have really done some damage to the United States. What we're looking at today is the worst epidemics in US history. Now we're doing this list by dates and not by like the body count or something. In the early days, they really didn't have quality data. So we'll just list them by their date. Got it, get it, good. Let's take a look. Number 10, smallpox, 1633 to 1634. Now, smallpox had been around for a very long time. It's a variola virus. They have evidence that it wiped out entire societies in ancient Egypt, the Vikings. It's been everywhere on the planet. And in the 1600s, it pretty much did a number on the United States. Now, here's an interesting fact I learned about it. When they first found out about vaccinating against this, it was a Buddhist monk. Notice that people that had been infected and survived could help the people that were getting it and they wouldn't get reinfected. So they would take samples from other people that were infected and blow it into people's noses, of all things, as an inoculation. And it worked. Back then, about 30% of the people that got smallpox would die within the first two weeks. The inoculation had gotten them down to about 3%, they figure. Now, the first recorded cases of smallpox in the United States was back in 1633. They're not sure how many people it killed, but they know it moved on to the Native American population and basically ravaged their population. Well, it went away. Then a British sailor disembarking the HMS Seahorse brought smallpox to Boston in 1721, causing more than 6,000 cases. At the time, Boston only had a population of about 11,000. They have 850 confirmed deaths from smallpox back then. Now, it is just destroyed parts of the world at different times. During the 18th century, the disease killed an estimated 400,000 Europeans each year, including five reigning monarchs. It was also responsible for about a third of all blindness. In 1770, Edward Jenner developed a vaccine from cowpox, which helped the body become immune to smallpox without causing the disease. After a large vaccination initiative in 1972, smallpox is gone from the U.S. and the vaccine vaccines are no longer needed. A uh, piece of advice, if you want to look up smallpox and you've never seen what it looks like, don't. It's, it's, I'll warn you right now, it's disturbing. If you're someone that's not squeamish, go ahead. Number nine, yellow fever. Yellow fever's been around since forever. They're really not sure when it first showed up, but the first definitive outbreak of yellow fever in the New World was in 1647 on the island of Barbados. Now, it goes by different names. It's also called the Yellow Plague or Yellow Jacket, and it is spread by infected mosquitoes. They found when they control mosquitoes, the disease goes away or at least is manageable. The 1793 epidemic was brutal. Refugees fleeing the yellow fever epidemic in the Caribbean islands sailed to Philadelphia, carrying the virus with them. Yellow fever killed an estimated 5,000 people in Philadelphia. At the time, Philly was the capital of the U.S., so the national government fled to the city of Trenton, New Jersey, including President George Washington. That wasn't our first run-in with yellow fever. New Orleans and Shreveport, Louisiana also suffered a major outbreak of the disease. Urban epidemics continued in the United States until 1905, with the last outbreak affecting New Orleans. A vaccine was developed and then licensed in 1953. One vaccine is enough for life. It's mostly recommended for those nine months or older especially if you live or travel to high-risk areas. Symptoms of yellow fever include a fever, yellowing of the skin and eyes, bloody vomit, which is always wonderful, muscle aches, liver and kidney failure, and seizures. Symptoms typically improve within five days, but in about 15% of people within a day of improving, the fever comes back with worse symptoms, abdominal pain and more damage to internal organs and more yellowing of the skin. In 1927, the yellow fever virus was the first human virus to be isolated. Number eight, cholera. 
1832 to 1866. The United States has had three serious waves of cholera between 1832 and 1866. A person with cholera has the same symptoms as a person that ate a bus station burrito. Diarrhea, vomiting, dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, rapid heartbeat, weight loss, and low blood pressure. Cholera is an infection of the small intestines, and it's usually spread by unsafe water and food that has been contaminated with human excrement that contain the bacteria. Undercooked shellfish is also a common source. New York City was the first U.S. city to feel the impact of cholera. Between 5 and 10 percent of the total population died from cholera. Now, they really aren't sure what ended this pandemic, but it may have been the change in climate or the use of quarantine measures. Who knows? By the early 1900s, outbreaks had ended. But cholera continues to affect an estimated 3 to 5 million people worldwide and causes between 30,000 and 130,000 deaths a year. Most of those deaths come from Africa and Southeast Asia. Number seven, scarlet fever, 1858. When I was in high school, I didn't know this was a real thing. I had a really good friend that just dated redhead girls and we said he had scarlet fever. But common symptoms are red rashes that start on the face or neck and spread onto the arms, trunk, <laughs> trunk and legs, strawberry tongue and a flushed face. Other symptoms include a very high fever, sore throat, difficulty swallowing, enlarged glands in the neck and uncontrolled vomiting. When scarlet fever hit the United States in 1858, it was pretty much all over the United States. It is treatable with antibiotics. Long-term complications as a result of scarlet fever include kidney disease, heart disease, and arthritis. They're not sure when it started, but they know that Greek physicians uh, recorded cases of it back in 400 BC. There was a test invented for this in 1924, known as the Dick Test. To identify those susceptible to scarlet fever, it was invented by George F. Dick and Gladys Dick. Number six, H1N1 flu, 1918. This is commonly known as the swine flu. It is a type of influenza A virus and is one of several flu virus strains that can cause the seasonal flu. Symptoms are the same as the seasonal flu, sometimes fever, chills, cough, sore throat, runny, stuffy nose, body aches, fatigue, diarrhea, and vomiting. Here's a fun fact. Most people believe you can get swine flu from eating pork. That is false. The 1918 outbreak was called the Spanish flu. It was thought it actually came from Spain. It is estimated that 500 million people or one third of the world's population became infected with the virus. The number of deaths was estimated to be at least 50 million worldwide with about 675,000 occurring in the United States. After World War I, cases of the flu slowly declined. None of the suggestions provided at the time were effective cures. One of that was drinking coal oil. Today's treatments include bed rest fluids and antiviral medication. The virus strains mutate every year, making it important to get your yearly flu vaccine to decrease the risk. Now, there's a lot of opinions on this one, both from medical professionals and from everyone else. Some people believe you only do it when you're at risk, maybe when you're a child and when you get older, and that young people in their 20s and 30s, maybe even 40s, should just weather it to kind of build up immunity. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I'm just a guy that talks into a microphone and giggles when I find out that there's something actually called the dick test. Yeah, when I first read that, it took me a couple minutes to recover. Number five, diphtheria, 1921 to 1925. This is another one that's hit the United States a few times. It is a bacterial infection of the nose and throat. Symptoms include sore throat, fever, swollen lymph nodes, throat covered in a gray thick membrane, difficulty swallowing and wheezing. Sometimes bacterial toxins can enter the bloodstream and cause fatal heart and nerve damage. Diphtheria peaked in the U.S. in 1921 with 206,000 cases. Most the infections were asystematic or were mild cases. But in some outbreaks, more than 10% of those diagnosed with the disease die. Diphtheria is usually spread between people by direct contact or through the air. It may also be spread by contaminated objects. By the mid-1920s, researchers licensed a vaccine 
vaccine against the bacterial disease. That vaccine is still available today and it's very effective. In 2015, 4,500 cases were officially reported worldwide. That's down from nearly 100,000 in 1980. Diphtheria currently occurs most often in Sub-Sahara Africa, India, and Indonesia. In the U.S., only 57 cases were reported between 1980 and 2004. Today, more than 80% of children in the U.S. are vaccinated for this. Number four, polio. 1916 to 1955. This is a viral infection that causes nerve damage, which leads to partial and full paralysis. It is spread through direct contact with people who have the infection. Symptoms include sore throat, fever, vomiting, weakness, fatigue, back and neck stiffness, muscle tenderness, loss of reflexes, and meningitis. Symptoms usually pass within a week or two. Years after recovery, post-polio syndrome may occur with a slow development of muscle weakness, much like that of a person had during the initial infection. Polio has existed for thousands of years with the depiction of the disease in ancient art. It was first recognized and identified in 1789. Major outbreaks started to occur in the late 19th century in Europe and in the U.S. in the 20th century. It became one of the most worrying childhood diseases. Outbreaks occurred regularly in the United States through the 1950s with two major polio outbreaks in 1916 and 1952. Of the 57,000 reported cases in 1952, there were 3,145 deaths. In 1955, Dr. Jonas Salk's vaccine was approved. It was quickly adopted throughout the world. By 1962, the average number of cases dropped to about 910. The CDC reports that the United States has been polio-free since 1979. That's an amazing story, actually. I remember my grandmother saying she had friends growing up that got polio and uh, got paralyzed. Must have been horrible. Horrible, especially if you're a kid. Could you imagine that? One day you're fine, you get a cold, next thing you know you're in a wheelchair or worse. Number three, H2N2 flu, 1957. The H2N2 is a subtype of the influenza A virus. It mutated into various different strains that are found in birds. This one carried the nickname of the Asian flu. And that's because the virus originated in Singapore in February of 1957. By June of 1957, it had showed up in coastal towns in the US. The estimated number of deaths was 1.1 million worldwide with about 116,000 in the United States. They say this pandemic could have been a lot worse, but it was caught early and scientists were able to develop a vaccine pretty fast because of experience they had from the first flu vaccine in 1942. Number two, the measles outbreak of 1981. This one was first noticed at a pediatric practice in DeKalb County, Georgia. It came from a 12-year-old boy who was vaccinated against measles at 11 and a half months old. He was at the office to check on a rash he'd had for about two days. He'd also been coughing vigorously. Seven secondary cases of measles occurred due to the exposure. Four children had transient contact with the 12-year-old boy as he entered and exited the doctor's office. So they actually tracked this one down to a specific time and place. The risk of measles for unvaccinated infants was 80%. The outbreak proved that when airborne, the measles virus can survive at least one hour. Airflow studies showed that droplet nuclei generated in the examining room used by the boy dispersed throughout the entire office. The virus caused fever, runny nose, cough, red eyes, sore throat, and later a rash that spread to the whole body. Back in the day before vaccines, almost every single child got measles. In the second half, of the 20th century, most cases were due to inadequate vaccination coverage. Doctors eventually began to recommend a second vaccine for everyone, and since then, each year, there have typically been fewer than 1,000 cases, even though 2019 was a little bit weird, they had more than that. Bonus pandemic. All right, we're getting a bonus one here. This one's a little strange. It's Typhoid Mary, 1906 to 1907. It's also known as typhoid fever. And this was basically spread by one person, Mary Mallon, also known as Typhoid Mary. She spread the bacterial infection to about 122 New Yorkers during her time as a cook on an estate and in a hospital unit. Only about five of the 122 New Yorkers who contracted the illness from Mary Mallon died. Now they recognized that she was a carrier of this. She showed 
showed no symptoms and they basically told her not to work in food anymore. She carried this disease. She continued to work as a cook. Eventually they had gotten sick of dealing with her and they forcibly put her in quarantine for the last 20 years of her life on North Brother Island in New York. If you're looking for it, it's right there by Rikers Island and the East River basically. It used to be a privately owned island, but in 2007, it was purchased by the federal government and it's just abandoned and it's there for birds now. All right, before we get to number one, don't forget we have another channel called On This Day. There is a link down below. All right, on to number one. And number one, H1N1 flu 2009. The H1N1 flu is commonly known as the swine flu. In the spring of 2009, the H1N1 virus was detected in the United States and spread quickly across the country and the world. The outbreak made headlines as the swine flu, and that's kind of what everyone called it. Now, what's interesting is few young people had any existing immunities to the H1N1 virus, but nearly one third of people over 60 years old had antibodies against the virus likely from exposure to an older H1N1 virus earlier in their lives. At the time, the existing seasonal flu vaccine offered little protection against the new H1N1 2009 virus. While the new vaccine was being made, it was not available in large quantities until later in November after the second wave in the U.S. From April 2009 to April 2010, the CDC estimates there were 60 million cases, 274,000 hospitalizations, and 12,469 deaths in the U.S. from the swine flu. Globally, 80% of the outbreak's deaths were estimated to have occurred in people younger than 65 years old. In December of 2009, H1N1 vaccine became available to everyone. The strain continues to circulate as a seasonal flu, but causes fewer deaths and hospitalizations. Influenza strains mutate every year, making the previous year's vaccination less effective. So it is important to get your early vaccinations to decrease your risk. That's what the CDC suggests. All right, that's today's video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you got some information out of it. I thought this was very interesting. I hope you guys did too. Everybody have a great day. Be nice to each other.